fresh, hot pizza, steamy ramen, or waffles dripping with syrup? What's the best food? This question probably threw you for a second because we don't generally think of these foods as being on the same scale. Certainly, they're all food, but what's best really depends on your mood, unless you have a certain intense like or dislike of you know, one of them. Let's say I asked you which is better, Chicago style or New York style pizza. For that, you probably have an immediate answer, Chicago style, clearly. This question makes a whole lot more sense because these are both kinds of pizza. They are directly comparable. This is what we call a partial ordering in mathematics. When we have a set of objects, we can define a kind of ordering relation on certain pairs of objects, but that ordering might not apply to all pairs, such as, say, waffles versus pizza. If we take a look at a certain collection of objects, such as subsets of the natural numbers, set inclusion is also a partial ordering of this collection. For example, if we take the subset that has 2, 3, 4, it's clear that the subset 2, 3 is contained in the first subset. So we say that 2, 3 is less than 2, 3, 4 under this order relation. However, 3, 5 is not contained in that first set, even though it is smaller in the number of elements it contains, that is, its cardinality, we cannot say that 3, 5 is smaller than 2, 3, 4 under the ordering relation defined by set inclusion. That means that set inclusion is actually a partial ordering here. Now, we can come up with a set that contains each of 2, 3, 3, 5, and 2, 3, 4 in such a way that there isn't a smaller set that contains these elements. This would be called the least upper bound of this collection of subsets. This least upper bound is the subset 2, 3, 4, 5. This subset is larger than all the others in that each is contained inside of it. And if we remove any one point, then it is no longer bigger with respect to our ordering. Now there are other upper bounds. In fact, if we add anything to the set 2, 3, 4, 5, such as say 6 or 1000, then the new subset is indeed larger than each of our original subsets since it contains each one of them. However, it isn't the least upper bound since 2, 3, 4, 5 is a smaller subset that is also an upper bound of our original collection. What we are interested in today is a total ordering. In our last video, we gave a definition of real numbers, and we also defined what it means for one real number to be larger than another. This actually gives us not a partial ordering, but a total ordering, since we can compare any two real numbers. This is a property that is inherited from the rational numbers. Today we will show that given our definition of real numbers as equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences of rational numbers, the real numbers satisfy the least upper bound property. That is, if we have a non-empty collection of real numbers that is bounded above by, say, another real number, then there is some smallest real number that is also an upper bound of that collection. This might seem like something that should be obviously true, but we have another field of numbers that is totally ordered and does not have this least upper bound property. That is the rational numbers. The easiest example to look at is at all rational numbers whose square is less than two. Our intuition says that the square root of two should be the least upper bound of this set. However, Hippasus sacrificed his life to show us that the square root of two isn't a rational number. Let's not put his sacrifice to waste. So what I'm going to do is prove that the reals have this least upper bound property. First, we are going to work with our abstraction of equivalence classes, which will let us take a sequence of upper bounds that are decreasing. Then we will use the axiom of choice to construct a new sequence of rational numbers, where we take one element from a Cauchy sequence in each one of those equivalence classes. And then we will show that this new sequence is itself a Cauchy sequence. Finally, we will show that this Cauchy sequence is in an equivalence class, i.e. a real number, that is smaller than all the other upper bounds. That means that it is the least of our upper bounds. The core of this proof lies in this algorithm. Let's take an upper bound of s, and we will call it b0. And suppose that a0 is some element inside of s. Each step will change only one of those values, and which value change depends on the average of the current values. Let's look at the average of a0 and b0 which is a0 plus b0 divided by 2. Now, this is either a new upper bound for s, or it isn't. If it is actually a new upper bound, then we set b1 to be this average. If it is not a new upper bound, then there must be some element of s that is larger than or equal to this average. And we take one such element and we set it to be a1. Then we make a2 and b2, and we look at the average of a1 and b1 and do the same thing. What is happening here is that we are constructing a sequence of real numbers where the distance between an and bn is half that 
of an minus one and bn minus one. Also notice that each sequence is monotonic and bounded. So each sequence should be converging. But of course, that's exactly what we're trying to prove here. In fact, each sequence converges to the least upper bound of S. Before we get into the details, let's see if this algorithm even works. And we will use it to find an approximation of the square root of two, which should be about 1.4142. We earlier said that the set of all numbers whose square is less than two should have a least upper bound that is the square root of two. Let's pick an upper bound for this set as say two. And we start with one as a member of the set. That is B naught is two and A naught is one. Their average is 1.5 and the square of 1.5 is 2.25. Hence, it is a new upper bound for our set. That gives B1 as 1.5 and A1 stays the same as one. Let's average these two as 1.25. Now the square of 1.25 is less than two. So we find a member of A that is greater than or equal to 1.25. Since 1.25 is in our set, we'll just use that. B2 is 1.5, it didn't change, and A2 is 1.25. The next round average is 1.375. This is less than two, so we get B3 as 1.5 and A3 as 1.375. The next average is 1.4375. The square of this is bigger than two. So it's an upper bound and we replace B this time. That gives us B4 as 1.4375 and A4 as 1.375. One last time we get an average of 1.40625, which we replace the A term. After four rounds, we are starting to see that we are settling on the first two digits of the square root of two. This can be done by hand, but it's a bit slower than the typical Heron's method for computing the square root of two, which is equivalent to using Newton's method and the polynomial x squared minus two. However, without using anything really complicated, we have just found a credible method of computing square roots. Now, before we go ahead and get into the proof, I just wanted to say thank you for watching this far. And if you like the video, then please hit that like button and tell YouTube that I'm doing something that you appreciate. Also, we are going to get into metric spaces, compact sets, and even talk about fractals in a little bit. So subscribe if you want to see more of that in the future. One way or another, I really appreciate seeing you get this far. And let's go ahead and not waste any more time and get to the meat of the video. The proof. All right, now we will prove that the real numbers expressed through equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences of rational numbers has the least upper bound property. First, let's talk about the distance between two real numbers since we haven't addressed that yet. This is pretty easy to do since if we take two real numbers and select a Cauchy sequence from each equivalence class, then the real number that represents the distance between the two numbers is the one that contains the Cauchy sequence corresponding to the absolute value of the difference between the members of the first two sequences. Essentially, the distance between two real numbers is the limit of the distance between the members of the respective Cauchy sequences. And truly, once we have this least upper bound property, we are not gonna need to talk about the real numbers as Cauchy sequences anymore, and thank goodness for that. This distance also satisfies the triangle inequality, just like the one for rational numbers, and later we'll see that this is something called a metric. And if the distance between two real numbers is zero, then we say that they are the same real number. This follows from our definition in the previous video, and you can find the link to that video in the description. Let's look at our algorithm again. For a set S, we have two sequences that should be approaching the least upper bound of S, A n and B n. If we look at the distance between A1 and B1, we can quickly see that this is bounded by half of the distance between A0 and B0. Let's make this an explicit lemma, which will become a chunk later in our theorem. We will want to use this later when we talk about the distance between consecutive terms of B n. Let's prove this. Take A1 minus B1, we replaced only one of A0 and B0 when we moved to the next element in the sequence. And these were replaced with either the average of A0 and B0 in the case that the average is an upper bound, which would then simplify to say this, or we replaced A0 with something bigger than the average, but less than B0, since the A terms are always an S. In that case, we see that replacing A1 with the average of A0 and B0 gives us a quantity that is even bigger than the difference between A1 and B1, and then we can simplify to this. Thus, the distance between A1 and B1 is less than or equal to half the distance between A0 and B0. We can continue to see that the distance between AN and BN is less than or equal to one half to the nth power times the distance between A0 and B0, and 
that will become very useful later. Now for the least upper bound property, we are going to look at the sequence BN that should be decreasing monotonically to our least upper bound. We are going to show that it is a Cauchy sequence of real numbers, and from that we are going to extract a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers. This extracted sequence is then is in our equivalence class defining our real number. And we are thinking of this as really just a limit of all our BN sequences, but we actually have to make something for that limit to actually approach to. So in order to do this, we first need to look at consecutive entries of BN. The distance between BN and BN minus one is either going to be zero, if they are the same number, that is, A was replaced in that step and not B, or it is bounded by half the distance between A n minus one and B n minus one. We see that since if B n was replaced by the average, the absolute value of the distance between B n and B n minus one simplifies like this. And we know that we can replace that difference by this because of our lemma. Now we are going to use that triangle inequality again. We want to show that this sequence is a Cauchy sequence. Before we select an epsilon, let's set the stage first by looking at the distance between bm and bn for two integers n and m, and we'll take m to be the larger of the two. We have a nice result already for consecutive terms, so let's rewrite this difference by inserting a bunch of zeros in there, and for each zero, we're going to write it as the difference of one of our intermediate b terms and itself. Now we can group all of those together and split this distance using the triangle inequality. Each one of these individual terms we know can be written like this, where we have the same distance between a0 and b0 and a power of 1 half. Factor out the absolute value and a 1 half to the n, and we're left with a geometric sum of 1 halves. Now what we're going to do is we're going to try to simplify that sum on the right. And we're going to use the fact that the series of powers of 2 equals 2, and that is something that goes back to the Greeks around 350 BC or even earlier. I use that date because that's when Euclid was kicking around. So we see that the distance between bm and bn is bounded by a constant times 1 half to the nth power. Hence, if we set epsilon to be greater than 0, we can find a capital N such that 1 half to the capital N is going to be less than epsilon divided by a0 minus b0 in absolute value times 2. Moreover, for every m and n bigger than capital N, we have this bound on the distance between bm and bn. Hence, this is a Cauchy sequence of real numbers. Now we want to get a real number out of it. Okay, so this video is getting really long and from here on it's going to get to be extremely technical. So in order to please the YouTube algorithm, I've actually split the video a little bit. And so here this first chunk is sort of the sketch of how everything should happen. And if you want to see the rest, I have a link in the video description and I'll put a link at the very end of the video where you can go on and see the, the rest of the argument. So I want to thank you for watching this far and I hope you follow that link if you want more information here. And otherwise, well, I hope you have a great day.